Hey folks, before we dive into today's stories, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more and longer stories. Let's enjoy. Story number one. All right, so this isn't one of those dumb don't play with a Ouija board or you'll get haunted stories. I always thought that stuff was just urban legends, something to scare kids at sleepovers. I'm not a kid. I'm 27, I've got bills to pay, and until recently the scariest thing I had to deal with was my rent going up. But all that changed after a really bad night where I made the dumbest decision of my life. And it's not like I was trying to summon spirits. Hell, it wasn't even my Ouija board. This started a couple of weeks ago when my buddy Chris and I went over to hang out with his cousin Brandon. Now Brandon's one of those guys who thinks every horror movie is a joke, and he's got this weird obsession with buying creepy stuff off eBay, like taxidermy animals, haunted dolls, you name it. That night he pulls out an old Ouija board that looks way too legit to be a Parker Brothers version. It had these weird carvings along the edges, symbols I didn't recognise. I swear the planchette was stained with something dark brown, and Brandon made some offhand joke about it being blood. We all laughed it off, because who takes that seriously, right? Brandon suggested we give it a go. I wasn't really in the mood. Ouija boards were always this weird boundary for me. But I also didn't want to be the buzzkill, and Chris was already dragging the board to the centre of the coffee table. So, against my better judgement, I sat down with them. We turned off the lights and Brandon lit a couple of cheap candles he had lying around. The whole thing was stupidly cliché, but I figured, whatever, it's just a dumb game. At first it was all fun and games. Chris asked the usual questions. Is there a spirit here? What's your name? How did you die? The planchette barely moved, and Brandon kept making exaggerated ghost noises. I thought it was him pushing the thing around to mess with us. Then something weird happened. It felt different. The planchette moved faster, like it had a mind of its own. The air in the room felt heavy, like that uncomfortable silence before someone tells you bad news. That's when I should have stopped. But no. I had to be the idiot who tried to be funny. I leaned in close and said, Hey spirit, what's my blood type? The planchette snapped to life. I swear, it dragged itself across the board like someone was pulling it with invisible strings. It spelled out my exact blood type. O negative. Now, here's the thing. Nobody knows my blood type. Not Chris, not Brandon, nobody. Hell, I didn't even know it until a couple of years ago when I needed surgery. That's when it hit me that something was seriously off. I laughed it off, but it was that kind of nervous laugh you make when you're trying not to lose your mind. Chris thought it was hilarious. Man, maybe the spirit's got a medical degree, he joked. But I noticed how Brandon looked different. His face went pale, and his hand shook a little as he pulled away from the planchette. I asked him what was wrong, and he just muttered something like, It's not supposed to know that. Now I was spooked, but I played it cool. All right, what does that mean? I asked the board big mistake. The thing jerked under our fingers again, spelling out C-O-N-T-R-A-C-T. -T. Brandon shot up, looking like he'd seen a ghost, and told us we needed to stop immediately. He blew out the candles and shoved the board back into its box. I thought he was overreacting, but the dude was visibly shaken. I'd never seen him like that. As he started mumbling something about blood rituals and binding agreements, I felt this cold knot form in my stomach. I tried to laugh it off, but there was this nagging feeling that we'd just opened a door we couldn't close. We left pretty quickly after that. Chris thought Brandon was being dramatic. I tried to agree, but deep down, something just didn't sit right. That night, I went back to my apartment and tried to forget about the whole thing. I threw on some Netflix, cracked open a beer and figured that was that. But things got... weird. I woke up around 3am, one of those sudden jarring wake-ups where your heart's pounding and you don't know why. I was drenched in sweat and the room smelled metallic like pennies or rust. I sat up and noticed something on my arm. There was a small cut on my wrist. Just a tiny, thin line, like someone had sliced me with a razor. It wasn't bleeding much, but it looked fresh. I know for a fact it wasn't there when I went to bed. I started checking my apartment, thinking maybe I'd scratched myself in my sleep or something. But the more I looked, the more paranoid I became. My front door was still locked. My windows were shut. Nothing was out of place, except for a single piece of paper sitting on my kitchen counter. It wasn't there before. I know it wasn't. I picked it up and my stomach dropped. It was a contract. Not some generic, legal-looking contract. 
This one looked ancient, like it had been written on parchment with a quill pen. At the bottom, in this strange ink that looked suspiciously like blood, was my name. I felt my hands go clammy as I read through it. The contract was short, but it made my skin crawl. In exchange for revealing thy blood type to the board, thou hast entered into an eternal pact. Thy blood is now ours to claim whenever and however we see fit. And here's the part that really fasterisk, asterisk, asterisk, ed me up. Failure to comply will result in immediate forfeiture of life and soul. I stood there, clutching that paper, trying to convince myself this was some elaborate prank. Maybe Chris or Brandon was messing with me, but the air in my apartment felt wrong, like something was watching me. I could almost hear it, this faint, raspy breathing that wasn't mine. Then my phone buzzed. It was a message from an unknown number. No text, just a picture. A picture of me, asleep in my bed, taken from inside my apartment. That's when I knew. This wasn't a joke. Something had followed me home, and it wasn't done with me yet. I didn't sleep the rest of that night. Hell, I couldn't even sit still. I locked myself in the bathroom with a kitchen knife, sitting on the cold tile floor, shaking like a goddamn leaf. Every few minutes I'd get up and check the shower curtain, convinced something was hiding behind it. My mind was racing. If Brandon knew more than he let on, I had to talk to him. But it was 4am, and I knew showing up at his door that early would only make me look insane. When morning finally came, I grabbed my stuff and bolted out of the apartment. The walk down the hallway felt endless. Every flickering light made my heart race, and every creak of the floorboards had me whipping around. I knew something was off, like the air around me had weight to it. I made it to my car, locked the doors and just sat there for a second trying to breathe. Then I noticed it. There was blood on my steering wheel. Not a lot, but a couple of smears like someone had wiped a finger across it. I checked my hands, clean, no cuts, nothing. I sat there, frozen, staring at the wheel like it was about to bite me. It wasn't there last night. I know it wasn't. I decided I wasn't going to Brandon's right away. I needed answers. Fast. I drove to the nearest coffee shop, parked in the corner lot and pulled out my phone. I texted Brandon. What the hell did we do last night? It took him ten minutes to respond, and when he did, his message sent chills through me. Get rid of the paper. Burn it. Don't read it again. Burn it? What the hell? This didn't feel like some prank anymore. I texted back. What does it mean? What's going to happen? His response came almost instantly. You need to run. I stared at the message, my hands cold and trembling. I tried calling him, but he didn't pick up. Just straight to voicemail, like he was deliberately ignoring me. I sat in the parking lot for what felt like hours, my brain going a hundred miles per hour. Run from what? As if on cue, my phone buzzed again. Another message from that unknown number. This time, it wasn't a picture. It was a video. My heart dropped. I tapped it and my breath caught in my throat. The video showed me sitting in that exact spot in my car just seconds ago. It was recorded from outside the driver's side window. I whipped my head around, but the parking lot was empty, completely still. No cars, no people. Just that eerie, dead silence that feels unnatural, like the world is holding its breath. I threw my phone into the passenger seat and slammed my car into gear. I didn't even know where I was going. Just away. Away from that coffee shop, away from my apartment, away from whatever the hell was happening. My hands were shaking so bad I could barely grip the wheel. I drove for miles, watching the rearview mirror like a paranoid maniac. Every car that got too close, every pedestrian that glanced in my direction, I saw them as a threat. After about an hour, I ended up at this crappy motel just off the highway. One of those places that smells like mildew and disappointment, with flickering neon signs and peeling wallpaper. I figured I'd lay low for a bit, try to figure out my next move. The guy at the front desk didn't even look up from his phone as I checked in. I gave a fake name. I don't know why. It just felt like the right thing to do. The whole situation was giving me the creeps. Once I got my key, I bolted to the room, locked the door behind me, and wedged a chair under the handle for good measure. I sat on the edge of the bed, trying to think. What was I dealing with here? A ghost? A curse? Some kind of psycho cult? My mind kept going back to that damn Ouija board, and more importantly, why it wanted my blood type. That's when I noticed the bleeding. It started as a tickle on my arm. I looked down, 
and there was a thin line of blood running from my wrist to my elbow, just like the cut I found last night. Only this time, there were more of them. Tiny, shallow cuts crisscrossing my skin like some twisted puzzle. I hadn't felt a thing. I rushed to the bathroom, grabbing a towel to wrap around my arm. But when I looked in the mirror, my stomach flipped. There was something etched into my skin. The cuts weren't random. They formed letters, words. I leaned closer, trying to make them out. Bound by blood. He's watching. I dropped the towel and stumbled backward, almost tripping over the edge of the bathtub. My skin burned, not just from the cuts, but from the overwhelming feeling of being claimed. It was like I could sense something creeping just beyond my vision, waiting for the right moment to strike. And then the lights flickered. I swear, for a split second I saw something standing behind me in the mirror. It was tall and thin, with limbs too long and a face that was blurred like it didn't belong in this reality. And the worst part? It was smiling. I spun around, but nothing was there. Just the empty bathroom, the hum of the fluorescent light buzzing above me. I was losing it. This thing was playing with me, wearing me down, and I was terrified that the worst was still to come. I tried texting Brandon again, but the messages wouldn't go through. My phone kept glitching, opening random apps, freezing, restarting on its own. At one point, the camera turned on by itself like someone on the other end was watching me through it. I threw the phone across the room in frustration, my breathing ragged. And then, just as I thought things couldn't get worse, I heard it. A knock at the door. It wasn't a friendly knock. It was slow, deliberate. Three taps, then silence. I froze, heart pounding in my chest. The knock came again, louder this time. Three taps, then silence. I stood there, paralysed, as the handle on the door jiggled just a little, like someone was testing it. The chair wedged under the handle shifted slightly. Whoever, or whatever, was on the other side knew I was in there. I crept toward the door, trying to stay as quiet as possible. My whole body was screaming at me to stay away, but I had to know. I had to see. I peeked through the peephole and my blood ran ice cold. It was Brandon. Or at least something wearing Brandon's skin. His face was pale and slack, like a puppet with its strings cut. His eyes were wide open, unblinking, staring straight at the door. And his lips were moving, whispering something I couldn't hear. Then, without warning, his head snapped toward the peephole, locking eyes with me. And I swear to God, he smiled. The knock came again, harder this time, rattling the door on its hinges. And then I heard it. The same raspy voice from the night before, whispering from the other side of the door. Time to honour the contract. I backed away from the door, my pulse pounding in my ears. I felt like I was going to throw up, but I didn't have time to think. I knew that whatever was outside wasn't Brandon. That smile. It was too wide, too unnatural, like someone pulling the skin of his face way beyond what it was designed to do, and those dead, glassy eyes. No life behind them, just something wearing his body like a costume. The knocking stopped abruptly. Three taps, then nothing. For a moment, everything went silent. So silent I could hear the blood rushing in my head. I stood there, frozen, gripping the kitchen knife like it was going to save me from whatever was waiting on the other side of that door. Then, the door handle twisted violently. Bam! Something slammed into it, hard enough to make the chair under the handle skid an inch across the floor. I jumped back, gasping, and tripped over my bag, falling flat on my ass. My head hit the wall, and stars exploded behind my eyes. When I scrambled to sit up, the door wasn't there anymore. It was still standing physically, but the peephole, the wood, it was like looking through a hole into somewhere else. On the other side wasn't the crappy motel hallway. It was something else. I swear, I saw an open field, tall, dry grass rustling under a blood-red sky. And standing in the middle of it was Brandon, his body twisted, bent at strange angles, like his bones didn't fit right anymore. His head was tilted too far to the left, and his limbs hung loose like they were about to snap off. But it wasn't just him. There were others. More figures, all pale and expressionless, with bodies that looked wrong, like mannequins trying to imitate humans. Their faces were blank. No features, no eyes, no mouths, just smooth, waxy skin. They stood in a circle, swaying slightly in the wind with Brandon at the centre, and they were all facing me. Then, in unison, they started to whisper. I couldn't hear the words, but the sound felt like it was crawling inside my skull. 
There was a low guttural noise, like the hum of a broken radio signal combined with static and faint unintelligible speech. The figures swayed harder, faster, like they were caught in some invisible storm and the whispering grew louder. It wasn't a normal language, it was something old, ancient, kind of thing you know instinctively you were never meant to hear. I clutched my ears trying to block it out, but it slithered straight into my brain like a parasite digging deep. Then Brandon, or whatever used to be Brandon, raised his head. His jaw opened impossibly wide, almost unhinging like a snake's, and he let out a wet rattling scream that made every hair on my body stand up. And just like that the peephole went black snapping me back to the dingy motel room. I scrambled to my feet, hyperventilating. My whole body was drenched in sweat, and my head felt like it was going to explode. This wasn't just some curse. It was something worse, something ancient and predatory, and I knew, somehow, that I was being hunted. I grabbed my bag, stuffed whatever I could into it, and bolted toward the window. There was no way I was staying in that room another second. I yanked the curtain back, and immediately wished I hadn't. Brandon was standing outside, right in front of the window, but his face was pressed against the glass. So hard his skin was flattening, his nose smeared like a bad wax sculpture. His eyes, empty and bloodshot, locked onto mine. His lips moved silently, mouthing the same phrase over and over. Time to honour the contract. I stumbled back, heart racing, and that's when my phone buzzed again. I didn't want to look, but I couldn't stop myself. It was another message from the unknown number. This time... It wasn't a photo or a video. It was a location. Coordinates. I stared at the screen, my stomach flipping inside out. I didn't even need to enter them into Google Maps to know. Somehow, deep in my gut, I knew exactly where they pointed. Back to my apartment. I couldn't think straight. My brain was on fire, racing between running, hiding, or giving up altogether. But something deeper, something primal, told me that whatever was happening... It wasn't going to stop until I played along. The rules were set the moment I asked that stupid Ouija board about my blood type, and now I was part of the game. I grabbed my keys and sprinted to my car. Brandon's distorted face followed me from the window, twisting into an even wider grin as I tore through the wee parking lot. I didn't look back. I couldn't. If I did, I knew I'd see him standing there, watching, waiting. The drive back to my apartment was a blur, Every mile felt like I was getting closer to something horrible. Like I was driving straight into the mouth of a beast. The coordinates kept flashing in my mind, pulling me forward like a hook in my brain. I knew I should have gone somewhere else. Anywhere else. But it was like my body wasn't under my control anymore. When I pulled into my apartment complex, everything looked... wrong. Too quiet. The lights in the parking lot buzzed faintly, flickering like they were struggling to stay on. There wasn't a single person outside, not even a stray car driving by. It felt like the whole world had emptied out, just for me. I stepped out of the car, knife clutched tight in my hand. My legs felt like jelly, but I forced myself to move. Every step toward my front door was torture, my skin crawling with the overwhelming sense that something was waiting for me inside. When I reached the door, my hands were shaking so badly I could barely fit the key into the lock. As soon as I turned it, the door swung open on its own, like it had been waiting for me. And there, sitting in the middle of my living room floor, was the Ouija board. The planchette was already moving, dragging itself across the board slowly, deliberately. It was spelling something out. B-L-O-O-D-C-O-N-T-R-A-C-T. My knees buckled and I collapsed onto the floor, staring at the board in disbelief. This thing was alive. It had been pulling the strings from the start, and now it was time to pay the price. And that's when I saw it. The same piece of parchment from the night before lying neatly folded on the table. But this time, there was something new at the bottom. A drop of blood. My blood. I didn't touch the parchment, but somehow I knew what it meant. The contract had started. I knew the second I stepped into that apartment that there was no way out. The contract was in motion, and I was bound to it. The smell of iron hit my nose immediately thick and nauseating. It was like being locked inside a metal box filled with rusted tools. That drop of blood on the parchment? It wasn't just a drop anymore. There was a small pool now, glistening under the dim light from the kitchen, spreading outwards slowly like it was feeding on something. The Ouija board on the floor creaked softly, as if shifting by itself, daring me to come closer. My legs felt heavy, almost like they weren't mine to control, 
but I forced myself to stay standing. I knew the board wanted me to sit down with it, and that if I did, I wouldn't get back up. Then came the knock, three deliberate taps at my front door. My whole body stiffened, my mind screaming for me not to open it. But I already knew who or what was standing outside. I tried ignoring it. I didn't move. I just stood there, staring at the Ouija board like it was some venomous snake about to strike. But the knocking didn't stop. It just grew louder. Three taps. Pause. Three taps. Pause. Each one rattled through me like nails being hammered into a coffin. Finally, the door swung open on its own. No more knocking. Just the slow, deliberate creak of old hinges and the sound of someone or something dragging themselves inside. I didn't want to look, but my body betrayed me. I turned, slowly, and saw him. Brandon. Only now, there was no mistaking it. This wasn't Brandon. Not anymore. His face was wrong, warped, like melted wax had been moulded back together in a rush. His skin sagged, pale and clammy, hanging too loose on his bones. His lips twitched unnaturally, as if he was struggling to remember how to smile. And then he spoke. You have to finish it. The voice wasn't his. It was layered, like two voices speaking at once. One of them was deep and guttural, almost growling, and the other was high-pitched, whiny, like a child pretending to be an adult. I felt the bile rise in my throat, and I took a step back, bumping into the wall behind me. Brandon, or whatever the hell was using his body, lurched forward, dragging his feet across the floor like they weighed a ton. His eyes, those empty bloodshot pits, locked onto mine. You gave your blood, he rasped. Now it belongs to us. I tried to run. God knows I tried. But the second I moved, my knees buckled under me, and I collapsed face first onto the floor. It wasn't just fear holding me down. It was like my body had been drained of all strength, every muscle turning into dead weight. And then I felt it. The cuts on my arms burst open all at once. Blood started to seep out, soaking through my clothes, trailing down my wrists in tiny streams. But it didn't drip onto the floor. It rose, hovering in midair like the room itself was pulling it out of me. I gasped, clutching at my arms, but it was too late. The blood floated toward the Ouija board, swirling into the air like a crimson mist, drawn into the planchette like it was being sucked through a straw. I tried to scream, but my voice came out as a hoarse, useless rasp. The board was feeding on me, and then something spoke. Not through the board, but directly into my mind. The contract is eternal. The voice was cold and ancient, like it had existed for centuries, waiting for this moment. And I understood then, this wasn't just about me. This thing, whatever it was, had been doing this for a long, long time, collecting people, their blood, their souls, binding them to it through careless mistakes, through desperate choices, and now I was one of them. Brandon knelt beside me, his grin stretching wider than ever, until it looked like the skin on his face was about to split open. He grabbed my arm, his clammy fingers digging into my skin, and whispered, You shouldn't have asked about your blood. Now you're part of it, dot asterisk asterisk. The lights in the room flickered and the walls began to change. The peeling paint melted away, replaced by dark, slick stone. The air grew colder, thicker, like I was trapped deep underground. I could hear whispers now, thousands of them all around me. And then I saw them. Figures. Just like the ones I saw through the peephole. Pale, featureless, swaying. They surrounded me, their blank faces tilting toward me, their bodies jerking and twitching like marionettes with broken strings. They were the others. The ones who had fallen into the same trap before me. The ones who had given their blood and lost themselves to the contract. I tried to move, to fight, to scream. But it was no use. The board had me. Brandon leaned in closer. His grin now stretched from ear to ear. His eyes wide and unblinking. It's your turn now, he whispered. You'll serve like the rest of us. Forever. And then, as if on cue, the planchette slid across the board. One last time. It spelled out the final word, sealing my fate, O-W-N-E-D. I felt a sudden, sharp pain in my chest, like a hook had been lodged into my heart. And then everything went black. When I opened my eyes, I wasn't in my apartment anymore. I was standing in that same open field from before, the one under the blood-red sky. 
The wind howled around me, carrying with it the whispers of the others. My skin felt different. Colder. Thinner. Like I wasn't fully human anymore. And standing in front of me, grinning that awful wide grin, was Brandon. Or whatever was left of him. Welcome to forever, he whispered. And just like that I knew my fate. There was no escape, no loophole, no way out. I was part of the contract now, and it owned me, body, blood and soul. Forever. The last thing I remember before everything faded was the sound of the board dragging itself across the ground, spelling out another name, a new victim. And then I smiled, just like Brandon had, because now I knew someone else would come along. They always do. The contract is eternal, and blood always gets what it's owed. story. Number two. This story feels too surreal to be true, but I swear on everything this happened. And if you've ever been curious about Ouija boards, let me be the first to tell you. Don't even think about it. I used to think Ouija boards were just a stupid gimmick. A couple of friends gathered in a dim room moving a planchette around pretending to talk to ghosts. Nothing real, right? That's what I thought too. But it all changed the night my girlfriend Tanya convinced me to try one. I didn't know this stupid little game would turn my life into something out of a horror movie. I didn't know it would mess with my mind so bad I wouldn't even know when I was awake or asleep anymore. It started casually. Tanya bought the board from this weird antique shop in town. The thing wasn't one of those cheap plastic ones you get from Walmart. It was old, like really old, with engravings I couldn't even make sense of. She thought it was cool. Said it would be fun to play around with after we got drunk that night. I remember rolling my eyes and telling her it was all fake. But in my head I thought, why not? We were drinking, she looked happy, and I figured it would make for a laugh. It was just us in the apartment. Dim lights, candles on the coffee table, just for the mood. The kind of night where everything feels disconnected from reality, and you're already a little out of your head from the booze. Tanya laid the board on the floor, grabbed my hand and pulled me down to sit across from her. She gave me this mischievous grin that I'd normally love, but that night, something about it was unsettling. It felt too forced. The air felt thick, like the room was somehow heavier than it should be. I brushed it off as just the alcohol hitting, but now that I think back, that was the first sign something was off. We placed our fingers on the planchette, and Tanya, being Tanya, went straight into it. Is anyone here? she whispered in this goofy exaggerated voice like she was mocking the whole thing. For a moment nothing happened, just the sound of the street outside and our fingers resting on the cold wooden planchette. But then, the damn thing started to move. I jerked my hand back instinctively. Stop it, Tanya, I said. I'm not doing it, she insisted, her eyes wide with excitement and maybe something else like fear. She swore on everything that she wasn't moving it, and as much as I wanted to call her out for messing with me, her face looked way too serious. The planchette kept sliding across the board, smooth as if someone else was pulling it along. It spelled out H-E-L-P-M-E. -E. I laughed nervously. All right, whoever's doing this, you got me. Let's stop now. But she didn't let go, and I was too curious, too freaked out to walk away just yet. Who are you? Tanya whispered, her voice shaking now. The planchette moved slowly, deliberately. I-A-M-I-N-S-I-D-E. We froze. My stomach turned. Inside what? I asked, half joking but feeling a cold wave run through me. Yeah, I know I said I wouldn't use phrases like that, but I'm telling you, it was real. Something about it felt too close, too personal. The planchette jerked violently, dragging our fingers across the board. Why, oh you? That was when the air in the room got heavy, like unbearably heavy. It was the kind of pressure you feel before a panic attack, or when something terrible is about to happen. Tanya's face went pale. I've never seen her look that way. Not scared, terrified, like whatever we'd just invited was in the room with us. We need to stop, I muttered, yanking my hands off the board. Tanya nodded, finally snapping out of it, and shoved the planchette to the side. The thing was, it didn't matter. It didn't end there. The room got eerily quiet. No wind, no traffic, nothing. Just us sitting there, staring at the board like it might come alive. And then, the candles flickered. And in that split second, I swear, I saw something. 
a shadow moving just behind Tanya. It was tall, too tall to be anything human, and it was smiling. I jumped to my feet and pulled her up. We're done. This was a bad idea. She nodded quickly, grabbing the board to toss it out, but the thing was hot, like it had been lying in the sun all day. She yelped and dropped it, and that's when the lights went out. For a few seconds, everything was pitch black. I could hear Tanya's shallow breathing and my own heartbeat pounding in my ears. Then the lights flickered back on and everything in the apartment looked different. At first, I thought it was just the booze playing tricks on me, but no, things weren't where they were supposed to be. The couch was on the wrong side of the room. The clock on the wall was frozen at 3am, even though it had been barely midnight when we started. And worst of all, there were footprints. Wet, bare footprints leading from the board to the hallway. We didn't make those. I grabbed Tanya's arm. We're leaving, I whispered, trying not to panic. But just as we reached the door, it slammed shut with a force that shook the walls. And that's when we heard it. A whisper. A low, rasping voice that sounded like it was coming from inside my head. You invited me in. You can't leave now. Tanya started sobbing, clutching my arm so hard her nails dug into my skin. I fumbled with the door handle, but it wouldn't budge, like someone was holding it from the other side. And then I saw it again, just out of the corner of my eye. That shadow, standing by the window, watching us, grinning like it knew something we didn't. I wanted to scream, to smash the window and get the hell out, but my body wouldn't move. I felt like I was sinking, like the floor beneath me was dragging me down into some endless black pit. My hand started to shake uncontrollably, and Tanya, she just kept repeating, this isn't real, this isn't real. But it was, and it still is. Because here's the part that messes me up the most. We never made it out of that room. At least, not really. I mean, we're here now. Or at least it looks like we are. But nothing's been the same since that night. We'll wake up in the middle of the night, gasping for air, only to realise we're still sitting in that apartment, staring at the Ouija board. It's like we're trapped in a loop. No matter how far we try to run, how many times we smash that damn board to pieces, we always wake up back in that room. And every time the shadow gets closer, I don't know how much longer I can keep this up. I haven't slept in what feels like weeks. Every time I close my eyes, I hear it. That voice, that horrible, raspy whisper, telling me I'll never escape. I think, I think we're stuck in some kind of nightmare. And the worst part is, I don't think we'll ever wake up. If you thought the first part was bad, you haven't seen anything yet. That was just the surface. The nightmare didn't just stop at being trapped in the room with that thing. No, it got worse. Way worse. And now, I know for a fact that whatever we summoned isn't just toying with us. It's feeding off us. After that first night, we started noticing small changes. Little things that you could almost convince yourself were nothing if you weren't paying attention. I'd go into the bathroom to brush my teeth, only to look up and see the reflection in the mirror wasn't moving the same way I was. I'd blink, and it would smile at me. The kind of smile that's too wide, with too many teeth. Like someone trying to mimic a human expression, but doing a horrible job at it. Tanya was getting worse too. She stopped sleeping altogether. I'd find her standing in random places in the apartment, in the corner of the kitchen, by the closet door. Just staring at the wall like she was listening to something. I tried to snap her out of it, but it was like her mind was somewhere else. One night I caught her mumbling something under her breath while staring at the Ouija board. I leaned in closer and realised she was counting backward, in a language I couldn't understand. It wasn't Latin. It wasn't any language I'd ever heard. Her voice was raspy and low, almost like something was speaking through her. I shook her hard to wake her up, and she gasped like she'd been underwater for hours. She didn't remember any of it. Every night it was the same nightmare. We'd try to fall asleep only to wake up back in the living room, sitting on the floor with our fingers on the planchette no matter how many times we threw the board out. I burned it once. I swear I watched the flames swallow that damn thing whole. But the next morning, it was right back on the coffee table, looking as untouched as the day Tanya bought it. The day started bleeding together. I couldn't tell if we were awake or still dreaming. I'd wake up in places I didn't remember falling asleep. One time, I woke up standing in the bathtub, fully clothed with the shower running cold water over me. Tanya found me another time standing outside the apartment door, 
barefoot, holding a butcher knife in my hand like I was about to leave. I don't remember any of it. But the worst part was what started happening in the mirrors. I know it sounds crazy, but I swear we weren't alone in the apartment anymore. The thing we summoned, it started showing itself, but only in reflections. I'd catch glimpses of it out of the corner of my eye, tall, twisted, and impossibly thin, with long fingers that looked like they could wrap around my entire head. It had no face, just a black void where a face should be. But when it tilted its head, I swear I could feel it smiling. One night I was brushing my teeth when I saw it again, standing just behind me in the mirror. I spun around, but there was nothing there. When I looked back at the reflection, my own face was gone. Just a smooth, blank surface where my eyes, nose and mouth should have been. I don't know how long I stood there, staring at that horrifying reflection, but when I finally blinked, my face snapped back to normal, like it was never gone to begin with. That was the first time I screamed. I'm not proud of it, but I lost it. I threw the toothbrush at the mirror, smashing it into a web of cracks. Tanya came running in, asking what the hell was going on, but I couldn't explain it. I just kept muttering, it's not me, it's not me. She looked at me like I was insane, and maybe I was, but she didn't argue. Not anymore, because she'd seen it too. Things escalated after that. I could tell Tanya was slipping further into whatever nightmare we were stuck in. She stopped eating, her eyes became sunken, and her skin grew pale, like all the life was draining out of her. I tried to get her to leave the apartment just to get some fresh air, but every time we made it to the door, something stopped us. The handle would get too hot to touch, or the lock would jam even though there was nothing wrong with it. And then, there was the whispering. It started as a faint noise, just on the edge of hearing, like the buzzing of a distant television. But it got louder, more distinct, until I could make out words. Horrible, violent words, whispered in a voice that wasn't mine or Tanya's. It told us things, personal things, things no one else could know. It whispered about Tanya's childhood trauma, things she'd never even told me. It whispered about the accident I'd caused years ago, the one I never talked about, the one I tried to bury deep down inside. You belong to me now, it would say. You brought me here, you invited me in. We started sleepwalking more often. One night I woke up to find Tanya standing over me, holding a pair of scissors inches from my throat. Her eyes were wide open, but it was like she wasn't even there. I didn't scream, I didn't move, I just whispered her name, and after a few seconds she blinked and dropped the scissors, gasping like she'd just woken from a nightmare. We didn't talk about it. What was there to say? Neither of us was in control anymore. The thing inside the board, it was controlling us. It wasn't just messing with our minds, it was wearing us down, making us question everything, even reality. And then, one night, Tanya disappeared. I woke up alone, the bed cold on her side. I searched the entire apartment, calling her name, but she was gone. The front door was still locked from the inside, and the windows were shut tight. It was like she'd just vanished into thin air. But then I saw it, the Ouija board, sitting in the middle of the living room floor, with the planchette resting on a single word, M-I-N-E. I wanted to smash that board into a thousand pieces, but I knew it wouldn't do any good. I could feel the thing's presence watching me, waiting for me to make the wrong move. I knew that if I didn't play along, I'd end up just like Tanya, gone, lost in the nightmare forever. And so, I did the only thing I could think of. I sat down on the floor, placed my fingers on the planchette, and asked the one question I never thought I'd ask. What do you want from me? The planchette moved slowly, dragging under my fingertips like it was savouring every second. Y-O-U-R-S-O-U-L. That was when I realised this wasn't just a game. This thing didn't want to scare us. It didn't want to haunt us. It wanted to own us. And it wasn't going to stop until it got what it came for. I sat there, frozen, staring at the board as the planchette began to move again spelling out something I couldn't bring myself to believe. S-H-E-I-S-W-A-I-T-I-N-G. And then, from the bedroom, I heard Tanya's voice, faint, distant, calling my name. But the thing is, it didn't sound like her. Not really. It was close, too close, but there was something off about it, like someone trying to imitate her voice but getting the tone just a little wrong. And that's when I realised... 
If I followed that voice, I wouldn't be coming back. I'm still sitting here, fingers on the planchette, trying to figure out what to do. Do I go after her? Or do I stay and hope this nightmare ends on its own? I know what it wants, and I know deep down that if I don't make a move soon, it's going to come for me next. I just hope, whatever happens, I don't end up like Tanya. But something tells me it's already too late. I swear, things stopped making sense the second Tanya's voice came through that bedroom door. It wasn't like hearing someone call you from the other room. It was wrong. Like it echoed too much for the size of our apartment. It was too perfect, almost mechanical as if someone stitched together every word she'd ever spoken and played it back in a warped version of her voice. It sent a sharp, cold spike of fear down my spine, but I knew I had to move. I couldn't just sit there, fingers glued to the damn planchette, listening to that thing mock me. The board wasn't playing games anymore. It wanted to break me down bit by bit. I stood up, legs shaking, and stared toward the bedroom door. That voice, the one pretending to be Tanya, kept calling out, sounding sweeter and more desperate every time. Come in, babe. Please, I need you. But every instinct I had told me something awful was waiting on the other side of that door. My heart was hammering in my chest, and my palms were slick with sweat. I thought, what if Tanya is in there? What if I leave her, and she's stuck in that room alone with... whatever this thing is? And just like that, the door slowly creaked open. Not by much, just a sliver but it was enough for me to see the dark void beyond. There was no light inside, just an unnatural blackness that seemed to suck the air out of the hallway. The voice came again, softer now, almost like a whisper right in my ear. Come here. I'm waiting for you. I couldn't breathe. It wasn't just fear. It was the kind of paralysis you feel when you're standing too close to the edge of a cliff, knowing one wrong step will send you falling. My head told me to turn around and run, but my feet moved toward that door on their own. Something was pulling me in. I stepped inside the bedroom, and the door slammed shut behind me. The sound was deafening, like a gunshot, and I immediately knew I'd made a mistake. I reached for the doorknob, but it wouldn't budge. It was like the entire room shifted, becoming something else entirely. This wasn't our bedroom anymore. The walls were too far apart, stretching endlessly in every direction. The bed was gone. The nightstand, the lamp, Tanya's clothes, all of it had vanished, and standing there in the middle of the endless black space was Tanya, or at least something that looked like her. She was facing away from me, her long black hair hanging down over her shoulders. She stood perfectly still like a statue, too still. Every instinct in my body screamed that it wasn't her. Tanya, I whispered. My voice felt small, like it was swallowed by the darkness. She didn't move. She just stood there, with her back to me, head slightly tilted to the side, listening. Then, ever so slowly, she started to turn around. What I saw in that moment will haunt me for the rest of my life. It wasn't Tanya's face. It wasn't even human. Her eyes were gone, replaced by empty black voids that seemed to pull me in the longer I stared at them. Her mouth stretched far too wide, unnaturally wide, as if someone had cut it open from ear to ear. And worst of all, she was smiling. Not a normal smile. This was the kind of smile you'd expect to see on a predator right before it sinks its teeth into you. I froze. I couldn't move. Couldn't speak. I could feel something inside me crack, like my mind was tearing at the seams, unable to comprehend what I was seeing. And then, it spoke. You should have stayed with me. The voice was a twisted mockery of Tanya's. Soft, sweet but dripping with malice. Now it's too late. It started moving toward me, slow and deliberate, its head twitching unnaturally with every step. I wanted to run, but my legs felt like they were cemented to the floor. I could only watch as it got closer and closer. Just when I thought it was about to reach me, the entire room tilted. I felt like the floor had dropped out from under me, and suddenly I was falling. I woke up back in the living room, gasping for air. My heart was racing, and I was drenched in cold sweat. For a moment, I thought it was over. Just a nightmare. But then I saw it. The Ouija board was still there, waiting for me, and the planchette was already moving on its own. It dragged itself slowly across the board, spelling out a new message. Y-O-U-C-A-N-N-O-T-E-S-C-A-P-E. -E. Tanya was still nowhere to be found. 
The apartment was dead silent, except for the faint scratching sound of the planchette sliding across the board. My head was spinning and my hands were trembling uncontrollably. I wanted to scream, but there was no one left to hear me. And then I felt it. A cold breath on the back of my neck. Something was standing right behind me. I could feel its presence, tall, looming, malevolent. Every hair on my body stood on end as I heard it whisper, she belongs to me now, and soon, so will you. I spun around, but there was nothing there. Just the empty room, dimly lit by the flickering candles we'd forgotten to blow out. But the feeling didn't go away. That thing was still here, hiding just out of sight, watching me from the shadows. I knew then that this wasn't just a haunting. It wasn't even about the Ouija board anymore. This was personal. Whatever we summoned that night wasn't just some random spirit. It had latched onto us, and it wasn't going to stop until it had taken everything. Our minds, our bodies, our souls, and the worst part, I was starting to forget what was real and what wasn't. Every time I closed my eyes, I was back in that twisted version of the bedroom, with Tanya's horrifying smile burned into my mind. I could still hear her voice, calling to me from the darkness, promising that if I gave in, the nightmare would end. But I knew better. There was no escape from this. No waking up. And now, I'm not even sure if I'm still awake. The planchette continued to move on its own, slow and deliberate, as if mocking me. I wanted to smash the board, to set the whole damn apartment on fire if it meant getting away from this nightmare. But deep down, I knew it wouldn't matter. It's already inside. And the scariest part? It's not just the board anymore. I think it's starting to spread. Every time I look in the mirror, my reflection looks a little less like me. I'll blink and for a split second I'll see that same twisted smile that was on Tanya's face. And last night, I swear, I heard her whisper in my ear, even though I was alone. You'll never leave. We're together now. Forever. There's no going back. I've tried everything. Praying, begging, pleading with whatever thing we summoned to leave me alone but it just laughs. And now I know the truth. It was never a nightmare. This is real, and it's only getting worse. I wish I could tell you I found a way out. I wish I could say I woke up the next day and everything went back to normal. But this nightmare? It doesn't end. It only gets deeper, like quicksand. The more I struggle, the faster it pulls me in. And the worst part is, I don't think I even care anymore. It's like, this thing knows me better than I know myself and it's been breaking me down piece by piece until there's nothing left to fight with. It's not just the apartment anymore. This thing, whatever we let in, it's following me everywhere. I've started seeing it in places I shouldn't, at the grocery store, on the street, even at work. It hides in the corner of my vision, that same twisted, too tall figure with its long fingers and empty black face, always standing just far enough away that I can never get a good look at it. But I know it's there, and it knows that I know. I thought I was losing my mind until one of my co-workers pulled me aside in the break room. Hey man, he said, lowering his voice. Who's that woman that keeps following you? My blood ran cold. What woman? He shifted awkwardly, like he regretted bringing it up. I don't know. I just... I've seen her hanging around. She was standing outside your car this morning. Long black hair, pale as hell, kind of creepy, honestly. I nearly threw up right there. Tanya, or whatever's left of her. That's when I knew it wasn't just in my head. This thing, it's real, and it's dragging her down with it. I can feel her slipping further and further away like she's being hollowed out from the inside. Every time I wake up, there's less of her in the apartment. Her clothes, gone. Her shoes by the door, gone. Her side of the bed, cold, untouched, like she was never there to begin with. It's like she's being erased one piece at a time. And then the phone call started. At first, I thought it was spam, just random numbers showing up on my screen at odd hours of the night. But when I answered, God help me, it was her voice on the other end. Come find me, she whispered. I'm so cold. Please, just come get me. The line would always cut off right after that, leaving me sitting there in the dark, gripping the phone like it was my only lifeline. And every time I'd tell myself the same thing, it's not her, it's not her her. It's not her. But that doesn't stop me from answering the next call. A few nights ago I decided I'd had enough. I wasn't going to let this thing take her, not without a fight. I grabbed the Ouija board from the living room floor, threw it into the closet and locked the door. 
Then I grabbed a hammer from under the sink and smashed every mirror in the apartment. If this thing was using reflections to mess with me, I wasn't giving it any more windows into my life. For a moment, it felt like I'd finally taken control. The apartment was eerily quiet, but at least it felt contained. Like maybe I could outsmart whatever was happening, even if just for a little while. And then, at 3am on the dot, my phone rang. I shouldn't have answered it. I knew that deep down. But I was too far gone to care. I pressed the phone to my ear and what I heard made my blood freeze. It wasn't Tanya's voice this time. It was me. Come back to bed, the voice whispered. You'll feel better if you just come back to bed. I dropped the phone like it burned me. But even after it hit the floor, I could still hear the voice, my voice, coming through the speaker. It was soft, soothing like it was trying to lure me into a false sense of safety. And then it laughed. Not a normal laugh, a low guttural sound that made my skin crawl. It was the kind of laugh you hear in your worst nightmares. The kind that sticks with you long after you wake up. That was when I knew. It's not just after Tanya. It's after me too. I don't know how much longer I can hold on. Every time I close my eyes I'm back in that twisted version of the apartment, with her standing in the corner waiting for me with that impossible smile stretched across her face. And now, I'm starting to see myself there too. I'll wake up in the middle of the night and see another version of me standing by the window, just staring back at me. It doesn't move. It doesn't speak. It just watches, like it's waiting for something. And the worst part, it looks more like me than I do. I tried leaving the apartment once. I made it all the way to the front door, but when I opened it, I was standing right back in the living room, staring at the Ouija board. No matter where I go, it always brings me back here. There is no escape. The thing inside the board, it's winning. I can feel it. Every day it takes a little more of me, a little more of Tanya, until soon there'll be nothing left. I tried calling her parents, but they didn't even remember who she was. I checked her Instagram and every post, every photo, every trace of her gone. It's like she never existed. And now, I'm starting to wonder if I ever existed either. My memories are getting jumbled, tangled together like a bad dream that you can't quite wake up from. I can't remember the last time I ate. I can't remember if I ever had a job. Hell, I don't even know if the name on my ID is really mine. And the Ouija board? It's waiting. I know that if I sit down and touch the planchette one last time, it'll be over. I'll become just another part of the nightmare, trapped forever in whatever hell this thing came from. But maybe that's better than fighting it. Maybe it's better than being stuck in this limbo, half awake, half dreaming, never knowing what's real. Last night I saw her again, Tanya or whatever's left of her. She was standing in the hallway just out of reach, smiling that horrible twisted smile. And this time she wasn't alone. Standing next to her was me. Another version of me with the same dead, empty eyes and that same impossible grin. They reached out their hands, beckoning me to join them. Come with us, they whispered in unison. It's so much easier if you stop fighting. And for the first time, I felt it. Relief. Maybe they're right. Maybe this isn't a nightmare after all. Maybe this is just the way things are now. The Ouija board is in front of me again. The planchette is already moving, spelling out the same word over and over. Y-O-U-R-S-O-U-L, Y-O-U-R-S-O-U-L, Y-O-U-R-S-O-U-L. I think I'm ready. I think I'm going to answer. This is it. I know there's no going back now. I can feel it. It's almost over. Whatever this thing is, it's got me in its grip, squeezing tighter and tighter until I can't tell where it ends and I begin. I thought I had more time, but I was wrong. There's no more running, no more hiding. It's here. Last night I made a decision. I wasn't going to fight it anymore. I thought maybe, just maybe, if I gave in, the nightmare would end. I figured if I let it have what it wanted, I could escape. But I was wrong. So horribly wrong. Giving in wasn't the end. It was just the beginning. It started with the knock. A slow, deliberate knock on the front door at exactly 3am. I didn't answer at first. I just sat there on the couch, staring at the door, my whole body frozen in place. But the knocking didn't stop. It got louder, more insistent, until it felt like the sound was coming from inside my skull. I finally stood up and walked to the door. My heart was pounding and every step felt heavier, like I was walking toward my own funeral. I knew, deep down, that whatever was on the other side of that door wasn't human. But I opened it anyway. The hallway outside was pitch black. 
No lights from the street, no sounds from the neighbours. Just a wall of darkness, so thick it felt like it was alive. And then, from out of that blackness, Tanya stepped forward. She looked almost normal. Almost. Her skin was too pale, her smile too wide, and her eyes, God, her eyes were wrong. They were black, empty, like they'd been scooped out and filled with nothing but shadows. Can I come in? she whispered. Her voice was soft, sweet, too sweet, like a song you can't get out of your head no matter how hard you try. I couldn't speak. I just stood there, rooted to the spot as she reached out and gently touched my face. Her hand was cold as ice, and the second her fingers brushed my skin, I knew this wasn't Tanya, not anymore. It's okay, she said, still smiling. You don't have to fight it. You're almost there. And then she walked right through me, not past me, through me. It was like my entire body shivered from the inside out, like my soul had been pulled halfway out of my chest and then slammed back in. I turned around and there she was, sitting cross-legged on the living room floor right next to the Ouija board. She patted the space beside her, that twisted smile never leaving her face. Sit with me, she whispered. Let's finish what we started. I don't know why I sat down. Maybe it was the way she said it, or maybe I was just too tired to fight anymore. I lowered myself to the floor, and as soon as I placed my fingers on the planchette, I felt it latch onto me. It was like a hook had been buried deep inside my mind, and now something was yanking on it with all its might. My vision blurred, and the walls around me seemed to melt and twist, like I was slipping into a dream, or something worse. The planchette started moving on its own, dragging my fingers along with it. Tanya, or whatever she was now, just smiled her eyes gleaming with something that felt too much like triumph. Almost there, she whispered. You're so close now. The planchette slid across the board, spelling out one final word. H-E-L-L. -L. I tried to pull my hands away, but they wouldn't move. It was like they were glued to the planchette, as if the thing had become a part of me. And then the room fell away. I was falling again, tumbling through an endless void of darkness. It felt like every part of me was being pulled apart, unraveled thread by thread, until there was nothing left but raw, screaming consciousness. I don't know how long I fell, seconds, minutes, years, but when I landed, I knew I wasn't in my apartment anymore. I was in the other place. It looked almost the same. Familiar walls, familiar furniture. But everything was wrong, like a bad copy of reality. The walls were too tall, the windows too narrow, and the air smelled like rotting wood and wet dirt. Shadows moved in the corners, crawling along the floor like living things, and from somewhere deep within the apartment, I heard Tanya laughing. It wasn't the kind of laugh I remembered. It was a low, guttural sound, filled with malice, like she was enjoying every second of my suffering. You thought you could escape? Her voice echoed through the walls. There's no way out, not for you, not for anyone. I tried to move, but my body wouldn't listen. I was trapped, paralyzed, as the shadows began to close in around me. They whispered my name over and over like a chant, and with every whisper I could feel myself slipping away. I don't know how long I've been here. Time doesn't work the same way in this place. Days blend into nights, dreams blend into reality, and every time I think I've found a way out, I end up right back where I started, sitting on the floor, staring at the Ouija board, with that twisted version of Tanya smiling beside me. And the worst part? I can feel it spreading. I know it's only a matter of time before I lose what little is left of me. Already my memories are slipping through my fingers like water. I can barely remember what my life was like before all of this. My family, my friends. They feel like distant echoes, like people I read about in a book a long time ago. I don't even know if I'll recognize myself when this is all over. And now, the board is calling me again. The planchette is moving on its own, spelling out one final message over and over. Y-O-U-B-E-L-O-N-G-T-O-U-S. I think this is it. The end. Or maybe it's just the beginning of something worse. I don't know anymore. All I know is, I can't fight it, not anymore. Tanya's voice is calling me from the other room, sweet and familiar, promising that everything will be okay if I just let go. And maybe... Maybe she's right. If you're reading this, don't make the same mistake I did. Don't touch the board. Don't even look at it. Once you invite it in, it never leaves. I know now that there is no escape. 
There never was. I can hear the planchette sliding across the board again, spelling out my name over and over like a death sentence I can't outrun. It's waiting for me. And soon, I'll be gone. Tanya's voice is right outside the door now, whispering the same thing over and over. Come with me. It's so much easier if you just stop fighting. I think... I think I'm ready. I'm going to let her in. And when I do, I know I'll never wake up again. Story number three. It started with a stupid dare. You know the kind. You get a little drunk with friends, someone finds an old Ouija board buried in the back of their closet, and suddenly it becomes a challenge. A night of fun. It's always just a game, until it isn't. The night we played, there were four of us. Me, my roommate Cole, and our two friends Alicia and Travis. It was one of those Friday nights where the air feels heavy, like something is already waiting to go wrong. The house we rented was old and creaky, the kind that has pipes groaning in the walls at random hours. We joked that it was haunted, but deep down it didn't feel like a joke. It felt like a warning. Cole was the one who pulled the Ouija board out of a busted cardboard box he found in the basement. The thing was ancient, yellowed edges, the glass on the planchette cracked, and the letters faded. It looked used, like someone had played with it too many times and left something behind. Cole swore it was there when we moved in, but I never saw it until that night. You guys scared, he said, grinning like an idiot, already halfway through his beer. What's the worst that could happen? That's where it always starts. The words you say without meaning them. I don't think any of us truly believed in ghosts or spirits or whatever, but there was this weird energy in the room, like something was listening before we even started. Alicia lit some cheap candles to set the mood, and we sat in a circle around the board, knees touching, the flickering flames casting jagged shadows against the walls. The first few minutes were a joke. Travis kept spelling out curse words with the planchette, and Alicia wouldn't stop laughing. But then Cole got serious. He lowered his voice, leaned in close to the board, and asked, Is anyone here with us? The planchette didn't move at first. Just sat there, cold under our fingertips. I was about to crack a joke when it slid slowly across the board to yes. My stomach dropped. Who are you? Cole asked. The planchette circled the board lazily, like whatever was on the other side was playing with us. Then it spelled out a name. I-M-O-G-E-N. None of us recognised it. What do you want? Cole pressed. This time, the planchette shot straight to you. I yanked my fingers off the thing immediately, and Alicia did the same. I don't like this, she whispered. But Cole and Travis kept going, asking stupid questions like, How did you die? And where are you now? Every answer felt random, garbled nonsense that didn't make sense. Until the board spelled out I-A-M-W-I-T-H-T-H-E-B-O-X. That's when I remembered it. I had this old jack-in-the-box toy from when I was a kid, something my grandma gave me for my sixth birthday. It was one of those old creepy ones with a clown that popped out, its grin twisted and wrong, the kind of toy that makes you uneasy just looking at it. I kept it shoved deep in my closet because, honestly, it freaked me out. But I never got rid of it. Cole noticed the way my face changed. Dude, what's with the box? I shook my head, suddenly wishing I'd never agreed to this. It's just this old toy. Nothing. The planchette moved again, spelling out G-E-T-I-T. -E nope, I'm done. I stood up, brushing my hands off like I could wipe away the weird feeling crawling under my skin. Come on, man, Travis said, his grin widening in that annoying way he always did when someone else was uncomfortable. It's just a game. Go grab the toy. I should have said no. I should have shut it down right there, but the thing about dares... They get inside your head, make you feel stupid for being scared. So against every instinct screaming in my body, I went upstairs, opened my closet, and pulled out the jack-in-the-box. It was heavier than I remembered, the metal cold and rusted, the clown's painted face cracked and discoloured. I hated the way it grinned at me, like it knew something I didn't. But I carried it back downstairs and set it in the middle of the circle. The second I put it down, the planchette jerked violently to yes. See? Travis said, nudging me. Nothing to be afraid of. That's when the box started playing. 
We all froze. The handle on the side began turning on its own, slowly cranking out that eerie, tinny tune. Pop goes the weasel. No one touched it. I swear to God, no one was touching it. The song wound down, and the lid snapped open with a metallic click. The clown popped out, its head tilted at a strange angle, the springs inside rattling like bones. And then it spoke. I see you. The voice was low and scratchy, like nails dragging across wood. I backed up so fast I nearly tripped over the couch. What the fuck? Alicia gasped, her face draining of colour. It's just a glitch, Cole said, but his voice shook. These old toys do that sometimes, right? Before anyone could respond, the clown's head swiveled toward me, its painted eyes locking onto mine. I remember you, it whispered. Do you remember me? My heart slammed against my ribs. That toy hadn't talked before, ever. Then the board started moving on its own. None of us were touching it, but the planchette scraped across the wood, spelling out O-P-E-N-M-E. -E. No fucking way, I muttered, stepping back. But Cole, the idiot that he is, reached forward and yanked the clown out of the box. And that's when things got worse. Inside the box was a small bundle wrapped in what looked like old rotted cloth. The smell hit us immediately. Sour. Metallic. Like something dead and forgotten. Cole unwrapped the cloth slowly, his face twisting in disgust, until the thing inside was fully visible. It was a human tooth. A molar to be exact. What the hell? Alicia whispered, her voice barely audible. Then the lights went out. We were plunged into complete darkness. The only sound, the faint creak of the clown's head twisting inside the box. I fumbled for my phone, my hands shaking so badly I could barely unlock the screen. When the flashlight finally came on, I wished it hadn't. Alicia was gone. One second she was sitting next to me and the next, nothing. Just an empty spot on the floor, the candle still flickering beside it. Where is she? Travis whispered, his voice cracked with fear. I don't know, man, Cole stammered. She was right there. Then we heard it. The unmistakable sound of Pop Goes the Weasel playing softly from somewhere upstairs. Cole stood up slowly, his face pale. We need to get out of here. But I couldn't move. I was frozen, staring at the jack-in-the-box, my heart hammering in my chest, as the clown whispered one last thing. See you soon. And that's when Alicia started screaming. We didn't even think. The second we heard Alicia scream, we bolted up the stairs, every step creaking like the house was trying to hold us back. Her voice was sharp and panicked, coming from somewhere deep within the second floor, but the sound bounced off the walls in weird ways, making it impossible to tell where she was. I don't know what I expected to find when we reached the top. Maybe Alicia cowering in a corner, yelling at us for playing some messed up prank. But the second floor was empty. Just long, dark hallways and closed doors. The kind of emptiness that feels alive, like the walls are watching you. And then the music started again. Pop goes the weasel. It was coming from the toy. The jack-in-the-box was somehow up here now. It sat at the end of the hallway, just outside my bedroom door. The crank slowly turning on its own. I swear we had left it downstairs. No one had brought it up. But there it was playing that cursed song as if daring us to come closer. Dude, Travis whispered, I don't like this. No shit, I snapped. My voice sounded more scared than I wanted it to. Cole walked up to the box, muttering under his breath like this was all just some elaborate prank. He crouched down, glaring at the stupid toy like it had the answers we needed. I was about to tell him to leave it alone, but then the song stopped. For a second, everything went silent. No music. No screams, just the deafening hum of nothingness. And then the clown popped out of the box again. Only this time it was different. The clown's face wasn't painted anymore. It looked real, human even. Its skin wrinkled and sagging, with deep lifeless eyes that stared straight at Cole. Its grin was wider than before, stretching impossibly across its face, the corners of its mouth torn and bleeding. And then it spoke again, in that same raspy whisper. You shouldn't have brought me here. Cole staggered back, knocking over a lamp in the process. What the fuck is this thing? Before anyone could answer, the closet door next to my bedroom flew open with a loud bang. Alicia was inside. Or, at least, I think it was her. Her face was pale, too pale. 
and her eyes were rolled back into her skull, leaving only the whites visible. She stood stiffly, her arms hanging at unnatural angles, like a marionette with its strings cut. I could see her lips moving, but no sound came out. It was like she was trying to scream, but something had stolen her voice. Jesus Christ, Travis whispered, stumbling backward. What's wrong with her? Alicia took a step forward, and that's when I noticed something horrifying. Her hands. They were covered in jagged cuts, deep gashes that crisscrossed over her fingers like a web. She must have been scratching at something, or someone with all her strength. Blood dripped down her wrists, splattering on the hardwood floor as she shuffled closer. Alicia, I called out, my voice barely above a whisper. She didn't respond, just kept walking toward us, her movements stiff and jerky. And then she smiled. It wasn't Alicia's smile. It was the clown's, wide, empty, hungry. Cole grabbed my arm. We need to go. Now. But before we could move, the lights flickered just once, but enough to make my stomach drop. When they came back on, Alicia was gone again. No, I whispered, my chest tightening with fear. This isn't real. The jack-in-the-box sat silently at the end of the hallway, its lid still open. But something was different about it now. There was something inside the box. Something new. Travis was the first to notice. He leaned in, peering into the box like a curious idiot. What the hell is that? Inside the box, coiled around the clown's twisted body, was a clump of hair. Alicia's hair. Long, dark strands tangled and wet, as if they'd been ripped straight from her scalp. I gagged, the metallic stench of blood hitting my nose all over again. This isn't happening, Cole muttered, pacing back and forth. This isn't fucking happening. Then, out of nowhere, Alicia's scream echoed through the house again, louder this time, more desperate. It sounded like she was in pain, like someone was hurting her, and the sound wasn't coming from upstairs anymore. It was coming from inside the jack-in-the-box. What the fuck? I backed away, my heart pounding so hard it felt like it might explode. Cole grabbed the toy and shook it violently like that would somehow fix everything. Let her go, you piece of shit, he yelled, his voice cracking with panic. But all it did was make the clown laugh. It was the most horrifying sound I've ever heard. Not just a laugh, but a mockery. A deep, guttural noise that vibrated through my bones, like the clown was laughing at us, enjoying our fear. Then the lid snapped shut with a loud clang, and the music started playing again, slower this time. Pop goes the weasel. And just like that, the house went silent again. I don't know how long we stood there, paralysed with fear, waiting for something to happen. Minutes? Hours? It felt like forever. But nothing came. No more screams. No more music. Just a suffocating silence that pressed down on us like a heavy weight. We have to get out of here, I whispered, my throat dry and scratchy. Cole nodded, still clutching the cursed toy in his hands. Yeah, yeah, let's go. But the moment we turned to leave, something slammed into the front door downstairs with enough force to rattle the entire house. Bam, bam, bam. We froze, our eyes wide with terror. Who the fuck is that? Travis whispered, his voice trembling. Cole swallowed hard. We're not alone, man. The banging continued, louder and more frantic, like whoever was on the other side was trying to break down the door. Don't answer it, I whispered, gripping Cole's arm. Whatever you do, don't fucking answer it. But it didn't matter. The front door opened on its own, the hinges groaning under the weight of something unseen. And then we heard it. The slow, deliberate creak of footsteps making their way up the stairs. One step at a time. Creak. 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 I felt my entire body go cold. Whoever, or whatever, was coming up those stairs wasn't human. I could feel it in my gut, deep down where fear lives. Cole tightened his grip on the jack-in-the-box, his knuckles turning white. If this thing wants a fight, he whispered, then let's give it one. The footsteps stopped just outside the door, and the air around us grew heavy, thick with dread. I could hear my own heartbeat, loud and frantic in my ears, and then the door slowly began to open. What I saw on the other side will haunt me for the rest of my life. It was Alicia, or at least what was left of her. Her skin was pale and stretched too tight across her bones, her eyes sunken and hollow, her mouth hung open in a silent scream, blood oozing from her cracked lips. 
and in her hands she held the Ouija board. She stared at us with lifeless eyes, then slowly placed the board on the floor. The planchette moved on its own, spelling out one final message. You can't leave. And just like that, the lights flickered again. When they came back on, Alicia was gone. The jack-in-the-box was gone, and so was the front door. We were trapped. The front door was just gone like it had never existed. The walls where it used to be were smooth, seamless, no windows, no way out. The air in the house felt suffocating, thick with something wrong. Not just fear, but like we'd stepped into a place that didn't follow the rules of the real world anymore. Cole stood frozen, his chest rising and falling as he clutched the Ouija board like it might somehow help. This isn't happening, he whispered, his voice cracking. This can't be real. The worst part, I knew it was real. Whatever this was, it wasn't a dream. It wasn't some hallucination. It was deliberate. Something had us. Something wanted us here. And we weren't alone. The lights flickered again, and this time it wasn't just a quick flash. They stayed off for what felt like an eternity, the darkness thick and absolute. Then, out of the blackness, I heard it. A giggle. It was the clown. But it didn't come from the jack-in-the-box. It came from the walls, the ceiling everywhere. High-pitched and gleeful like it was toying with us. I hear it, Travis whispered, his voice shaking. It's close. We backed up into the hallway, trying to stay together, but the house had shifted. The walls seemed longer now, the doors out of place, like the entire place was rearranging itself to confuse us. It didn't make sense. The rooms, the hallways, none of it lined up the way it should have. And then something grabbed my ankle. I screamed and kicked wildly, stumbling backward. When I looked down, there was nothing there, just cold air and the smooth wood floor. But I could still feel the imprint of fingers wrapped around my leg. We need to move, Cole said, yanking me to my feet. Stay close. Don't stop. We sprinted through the warped hallways, doors slamming shut behind us as we ran. The walls groaned, almost like they were breathing, and the floor beneath us creaked and shifted with every step. I swear, I could hear something scuttling along the walls. Not footsteps, but something small, sharp, fast. Then the music started again. Pop! Goes the weasel. The song echoed down the hall, distant but growing louder, like the jack-in-the-box was following us, chasing us. Keep moving, I shouted, my heart pounding in my throat. We burst into what should have been the living room, but instead of furniture, the room was filled with old toys. Broken dolls, wind-up cars, teddy bears missing their eyes, all scattered across the floor like some nightmare version of a child's playroom. And right in the middle of the room, sitting perfectly still, was the jack-in-the-box. Cole stopped in his tracks, breathing hard. It's messing with us, he muttered, staring at the toy. No shit, Travis hissed, gripping his head like he was going to lose his mind. What do we do, man? We can't keep running. The jack-in-the-box sat there, silent, waiting. Then the handle began to turn again. I wanted to leave. Every instinct in my body told me to run, to get as far away from that thing as possible. But there was nowhere to go, no doors, no exits. So we stood there, frozen, as the music played. The lid snapped open and the clown popped out, grinning wider than ever. But this time, something else followed. Alicia. She crawled out of the box like some grotesque puppet. Her limbs bent and twisted at impossible angles. Her skin was stretched too tight. Her eyes rolled back into her skull and her jaw hung open, the corners of her mouth torn wide. Blood dripped from her fingers as she crawled toward us, moving like an insect. Help me, she whispered, her voice distorted and hollow. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. Cole grabbed the Ouija board from under his arm and slammed it onto the ground. This thing started it, he said, his voice wild with panic. Maybe it can end it. He threw the planchette onto the board and shouted, What do you want from us? The planchette flew across the board, moving so fast it nearly cracked the wood. It spelled out one word, trade. What the hell does that mean? Travis shouted, his voice breaking. The clown giggled again, and Alicia's body jerked violently, her bones cracking as if something inside her was shifting. It wants a trade, I whispered, the realisation hitting me like a punch to the gut. It wants one of us, in exchange for Alicia. No fucking way! Travis backed away, shaking his head. I'm not doing this. We need to find another way. 
Before he could finish, Alicia lunged at him, her fingers wrapping around his throat. Her strength was inhuman, her nails digging deep into his skin, drawing blood. Help me, Travis screamed, thrushing wildly. Cole grabbed the jack-in-the-box and slammed it down onto the board. Take it back, he shouted. Take the box and leave us alone. The clown's grin widened and the planchette spelled out, One of you goes. Travis choked, his face turning blue as Alicia's grip tightened. He clawed at her arms, but she didn't even flinch. We don't have a choice, Cole shouted. We have to do it. No, I screamed, panic overwhelming me. There has to be another way. The planchette moved again, spelling out the final message. Choose. Cole looked at me, his eyes wild with fear. It's him or us, he whispered. I shook my head, tears stinging my eyes. We can't. But it was too late. Cole shoved Travis forward, pushing him into Alicia's grasp. I'm sorry, man, he whispered, his voice shaking. I'm sorry. Alicia's twisted grin stretched impossibly wide as she dragged Travis toward the jack-in-the-box. His screams echoed through the room, desperate and raw, as the clown's laughter filled the air. And then, just like that, they were gone. The jack-in-the-box snapped shut, the room falling into an eerie silence. No more music, no more screams, just the overwhelming stillness of a house that had claimed its price. The front door reappeared. Cole and I stood there, breathing hard, our minds struggling to process what had just happened. We had no choice, Cole whispered, his voice hollow. We had to. I stared at the jack-in-the-box, sitting there so innocently on the floor, and knew that it wasn't over, because I could still hear it. The faint sound of Pop Goes the Weasel playing softly in the back of my mind. It wasn't done with us. Not yet. <laughs>